This is the first lecture in the series on benign solid neck masses. There are many potential causes of a palpable mass in the neck. Lymph nodes account for a large number of these, but we've talked about lymph nodes in the lecture on anatomy of the neck. Cystic neck masses are covered in their own lecture series. Obviously, a lot of the masses that we encounter in the neck are malignancies, but there will be several lectures on malignancies in the neck, particularly squamous cell carcinoma, so that will be covered in other venues. What are we left with? We're left with benign solid neck masses, which is the focus of this lecture series. This is just a list of the tumors that we will be discussing over the course of this lecture. We'll start with tumors arising from nerves. We'll then move on to abnormalities of muscle. We'll talk about inflammatory pseudotumors, vascular pseudotumors, and then other masses and pseudotumors. Finally, we'll round it out with a discussion of normal structures that can simulate a mass in the neck. Let's talk about paragangliomas. Paragangliomas are a family of tumors that share histology but occur in various places around the body. They are extremely vascular tumors, so vascular that they are essentially the same density as arteries when seen on uh, CT angiography or on contrast-enhanced CT. In fact, MR angiography is now considered the gold standard for identifying small paragangliomas. There is a classic description of paragangliomas on MRI as looking like salt and pepper. The pepper is supposed to be flovoids in the internal vessels. The salt is supposed to be increased T1 signal within thrombosed vessels. I'm not sure I've ever seen a great example of this, but that is the answer on the test. If, if anyone asks, what does a paraganglioma look like on MRI, the, the, the multiple choice answer is salt and pepper. There is a familial form of paraganglioma in the head and neck that accounts for some 30% of cases of paraganglioma in the head and neck. I'm proud to say that the gene for the familial form was discovered here at the University of Pittsburgh. When we talk about paragangliomas in the abdomen, we talk about the rule of 10. 10% 10 of them are malignant, 10% of them are metabolically active, 10% of them are multifocal. That rule of 10 does not apply to paragangliomas in the head and neck. A small minority of them are malignant and a small minority of them are endocrinologically active. But it's still not zero. Paragangliomas that arise in the head and neck occur in four predictable locations. Now, they can occur in a lot of other places, but they're rare in those other places. The vast majority of paragangliomas in the head and neck are attributable to these four locations. The four locations are carotid body tumors, glomus vagali tumors, glomus jugulari tumors, and globus tympanicum tumors. Now you'll sometimes hear people talk about glomus jugulotympanicum tumors. What that really is is a glomus jugulari tumor that has grown so large that it's visible within the tympanic cavity and can mimic the appearance of a glomus tympanicum. But it's really just a variant of the, or perhaps I should say the inevitable result uh, of an untreated glomus jugulari tumor. Other common sites include the larynx, but even those are not common at all. It's really those top four. The carotid body tumor is the most common site of paraganglioma in the head and neck. Carotid body tumors arise from the carotid body at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery. They classically splay the internal and external carotid arteries away from one another. This appearance on angiography or on a reformatted CT angiogram is called the lyre sign, named after the medieval stringed instrument. Carotid body tumors are classified surgically in order to describe how difficult the surgery is likely to be and how much blood loss to expect. There is a radiologic corollary to the surgical classification. What we use in the radiologic corollary is the circumference around which the internal carotid artery is surrounded by tumor. If the tumor abuts 
the internal carotid artery less than 180 degrees of its circumference, we call that a type 1. If it is 180 to 270 degrees, that is half to three quarters of the way around the tumor, that's a, a type 2. And if it goes more than 270 degrees, essentially encasing the internal carotid artery, that's a type 3. It doesn't matter how much the external carotid artery is encased. You can sacrifice the external carotid artery, no big deal. Only the internal carotid artery matters for the Shamblin classification. Here is an example of a carotid body tumor. This mass is exceedingly vascular. It is just as vascular as the arterial structures surrounding it. That is the key finding that enables you to make a specific diagnosis of paraganglioma is that extreme vascularity. Often you can see large vessels through the center of the lesion that confirm its high vascularity, usually easier to see on MRI as flow voids than on CT angiography. Now let's talk about the vessels and the relationship of this mass to the surrounding vessels. Here is the internal carotid artery and here is the external carotid artery. Notice that they are splayed away from one another. The internal carotid artery is being displaced away from the external carotid artery. These two arteries should be very close together at the level of the carotid bifurcation, they've barely had a chance to separate. But if you put a big mass between them, it will push them apart. This splaying is another critical radiologic finding of a carotid body tumor. If you do a sagittal oblique reconstruction of the carotid bifurcation, you can see the common carotid artery come up and you can see both internal and external carotid arteries. And here is the carotid body tumor in between pushing them away from each other. This appearance on this reconstruction and on conventional angiography has been likened to a medieval liar. In patients who have the familial form of paraganglioma, we can frequently see, frequently see bilateral carotid body tumors. And in fact, these patients often get other forms of paraganglioma scattered throughout the neck. If you see more than one paraganglioma, that patient probably has the familial form of the disease, and it's probably worth doing genetic screening on the entire family. These do not have to be large tumors. When they are very small, they are at the location of the carotid body, but they are extremely vascular. Um, this is exactly what the carotid body looks like, except it's too big. The second most common type of paraganglioma in the head and neck is the glomus vagali tumor. Instead of arising between the internal and external carotid artery, it arises behind the carotid artery and jugular vein, and just in between them, right where we expect the vagus nerve to run, because it's arising from the vagus nerve. It displaces both the carotid artery and the jugular vein anteriorly. Once it becomes large enough, it may separate those two and splay them away from one another usually the jugular vein going more laterally and the internal carotid artery going more medially. Now, the most common location for a glomus vagali tumor is in the nodose ganglion that lives two centimeters below the skull base. But glomus vagali tumors can arise anywhere along the length of the vagus nerve in the neck. Now, one might wonder how to distinguish between a glomus vagali tumor that's abutting the bottom of the um, skull base and a glomus jugulari tumor that's, that's coming down from the, the skull base, a glomus vagali tumor arises be exclusively below the skull base and shows no intracranial extension. That's how you can tell them apart. Here's an example of a glomus vagali tumor. Notice that the internal carotid artery is being pushed anteriorly along with the branches of the external carotid artery. It's not splaying the internal and external carotid arteries away from one another. It's pushing them all forward, pushing them all anteriorly. The 
uh, internal jugular vein is being pushed a little bit anteriorly and a lot laterally by this particular glomus vagali tumor, and you can see how they've been splayed apart. The arteries going anteriorly and medially, the vein going anteriorly and laterally. On CT angiography, once again, a very vascular tumor. It is essentially as vascular as the surrounding arteries and veins. Notice how the internal and external carotid arteries are both being pushed forward and not splayed apart. What's being splayed away is that internal jugular vein. The third most common type of paraganglioma in the head and neck is the glomus jugulari tumor. A glomus jugulari tumor arises within the jugular bulb. It may then extend inferiorly down into the neck. Usually as it goes through the bottom of the skull base, there's a narrow waist and you get a dumbbell sign with it expanding intracranially and extracranially away from the skull base. The classic finding that allows us to make a definitive diagnosis of a glomus jugulari tumor is erosion of bone. Specifically, the lateral aspect of the jugular bulb gets eroded and the tumor spreads up towards the tympanic cavity. If it has a sufficiently late presentation, it will succeed in getting into the tympanic cavity and it will be evident on uh, otoscopic examination and that's when we call it a glomus jugular tympanicum tumor. Clinically, it's very difficult to distinguish a glomus jugular tympanicum tumor from a glomus tympanicum tumor, but radiology can do it easily. Here's an example of a glomus jugulary tumor in the jugular bulb. Right, you can see it eroding into the surrounding bony structures of the skull base. I chose to show this particular image because it actually shows the classic salt and pepper. It is rare to be able to show this, um, but this unenhanced T1-weighted image actually shows the pepper of flow voids and the salt of thrombosed vessels within a, uh, a glomus jugulary tumor, a supposedly classic appearance, although most of them don't look like this. When you want to see the bone erosion caused by a glomus jugulary tumor, use CT. Look how clearly this permeative pattern of bone destruction is shown. Notice how it's predominantly moving in a lateral direction, like it's trying to get to the middle ear cavity. This is a really big glomus jugulary tumor. You can see that it fills the jugular bulb and extends down into the neck. We talked about how you can distinguish this from a glomus vagali tumor because of this intracranial extension. That's how you know it came from up here. But look also, there's this tail of enhancing tumor extending out into the middle ear cavity. In this case, frankly, filling the middle ear cavity and heading intracranial through there. This is a very large glomus jugular tympanicum tumor. Here's another CT image, this time in the coronal plane, because I think you can really see the extent of these lesions best in the coronal plane. Here's the jugular bulb. This should have a nice, well-defined cortical rim all the way around. You can see that nice cortical rim along the medial aspect of the jugular bulb, but when we get to the lateral aspect of the jugular bulb, that's where we can see all of the erosion, this destructive permeative pattern of bone. Um, and after we're done destroying the skull base, we knuckle up into the middle ear cavity. You can see how this lesion is a red mass in the middle ear cavity when viewed from uh, the otoscope. The fourth type of paraganglioma that we encounter in the head and neck is the glomus tympanicum tumor. The glomus tympanicum tumor arises along Jacobson's nerve. That's the branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve that runs through the tympanic cavity. That means that it arises in a very predictable location, right on top of the cochlear promontory. What's the cochlear promontory? It is the mound of bone that covers the basal turn of the cochlea as, as you'd see it from within the tympanic cavity. Normally, the glomus tympanicum tumor presents when it is still too small to really see the enhancement, so the predictable location is the key to the diagnosis. This bone right here is the cochlear promontory covering this basal turn of the cochlea, and that is right where we see the glomus tympanicum arise.
So it is this predictable location that distinguishes it. Now, can a cholesteatoma occur in this particular location? Sure, I suppose it can. Thankfully, these are easily distinguished clinically where a glomus tumor is extremely vascular and red on otoscopic examination, whereas a cholesteatoma is white on otoscopic examination. So get the clinical history and you won't have to worry. This concludes part one of the lecture on imaging of benign solid neck masses.